and welcome to the SOAS podcast. Each episode we'll be discussing the latest in economics, politics and culture. I'm Isabel Edwards and today I'm talking to Dr. Rosella Ferrari about Asia as method in theatre. So thanks for coming to speak to me today. Thank you. Um, and uh, this discussion sort of stems from the paper you wrote about the Toki experimental project. Yeah. So I was wondering if maybe we could start by explaining a bit more about what that project was about. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the project started in 2010 with the Shanghai Expo uh, when the Japan Pavilion, Com- Com- Pavilion commissioned a um, production. Basically, the pavilion, uh, the theme of the expo in general was sustainability, environmental sustainability, Mm -hmm. and better life, better city, better life, and the sort of themes. Uh, Therefore, the the one of the main themes of the pavilion was the toki, which is uh, the Japanese crested ibis bird, and in Japanese um, it's called toki, in Chinese it's called tuhuan, and uh, the scientific name is Nippon and Nippon, which is really suggests its significance for Japan mm. in terms of um, it's a national ident- an identity symbol. I think it was named as a national treasure in the 1950s. And uh, it's also connected uh, very much to diplomacy, so it has uh, some sort of significance, not only in terms of identity, but also in terms of um, reconciliation efforts between China and Japan. Uh, why? Because at some point, um, the uh, Toki was uh, believed to be extinct until they found some uh, specimens in China. Mm. And in 1999, China donated the first couple to Japan, uh, which was seen as a gesture of friendship and diplomacy, so much so that a political science in the US, I think, Mary McCarthy has written an article called Ibis Diplomacy, basically mm. comparing this exchange of bird gifts to, you know, panda diplomacy or ping pong diplomacy and other diplomatic uh, <laughs> projects. That, yeah. Or, yeah, so basically the, the Toki, uh, the first pair was in 1999, another one uh, I think in 97 and two also, and, and last year as well, a couple of others, and there's a sanctuary in Japan on an island called Sado where they now, um, they, first they were bred in captivity and I think now they were released to the wild, but just to um, underscore their significance in 2007, I think, at the height of disputes between China and Japan about a number of issues, China had promised another pair and then they withdrew the gift. Right, okay. Yeah, so the, you know, it just sounds like, what is it about this bird? <laughs> but it's actually quite interesting. So anyway, so the, the theme of the of the pavilion was the toki, so there were a lot of uh, videos about it. The um, personnel of the of the pavilion were dressed, uh, they were wearing headgear that was reflecting, you know, the, the, the colors of the bird and so on and so forth. So a Japanese director, Sato Makoto, who is, um, he's, I think, in his 70s now, he's one of the pioneers of uh, avant-garde theater, mm-hmm. underground, they call it, in Japan. In the 70s now, he directs a theater in Tokyo. Um, so uh, he was commissioned um, a production, and I think in his, his theater now, they do quite a lot of children's theater. Mm. So the idea was that this uh, performance would be for a general audience and would be like the final performance, um, the final thing that they would see after concluding the visit to the pavilion, and so our children were also among these audiences. And um, and uh, Sato uh, asked to collaborate, so to do a collaborative production with Danny Young, who is another pioneer of Asian theatre from Hong Kong. And that is quite unusual if you think about it, because normally you think of, of the expo as a showcase of mm-hmm. national culture. So. I don't. I think it was the only case of collaboration, and also another unusual, potentially a controversial, th- potentially controversial thing was that uh, after Danny Young came on board, they um, invited um, a performance from Nanjing to participate in the project. A performance from Nanjing, a performance of this uh, type of uh, um, traditional indigenous theatre called Kun Chu Kun Opera. Mm-hmm which is the um, most ancient uh, form of Chinese theatre which is still practiced today. And, uh, and that is unusual, I said, because normally if you think about, again, national cultures, 
uh, Beijing Opera would come, you know, mm -hmm. as the first choice, but I didn't. And also potentially controversial because Nanjing is the site of um, a massacre that occurred in 1937, over six weeks. And it's still, um, the memory and the legacy of this massacre is still contentious and it still keeps affecting Sino-Japanese relations to this mm -hmm. day. And not only the Kunchu actors were involved, but also children from Nanjing. So after the, the expo, they continued this um, partnership and this collaboration focused on the development of traditional uh, Asian forms which are, um, have been listed as intangible cultural heritage of humanity by UNESCO. And then eventually in 2012, they started a festival in Nanjing, mm. which I've written about. Mm. So it's quite overtly political what's happening. I think we'll come back to talk about that a bit. Just before that, I wondered what it actually looks like when you've got so many different styles of theatre that are all interacting at once. So we've got these very ancient forms and then something more modern in there. Mm -hmm. How, how I don't know if you if you went to see it or if yeah. you've seen it, but um, how it, what is it like when they're all interacting together? Well, the, <clears throat> the interaction is based on a format which, again, uh, Dana Jung's company called Zuni uh, from Hong Kong, they have... Um, pioneered um, in in the 90s and it's one table and two chairs so one table and two chairs is the standard standard uh, stage setting of um, most forms of, of indigenous Chinese theatre so Beijing Opera, Kun Tu and so on and so forth so basically in 1997 um, Jung and his company they started a collaboration project which initially involved uh, Sinophone practitioners mm -hmm. from Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, so again, political, um, to reflect on the idea of one country, two system, because 1997 was the year when Hong Kong was returned mm -hmm. to China, so one table and two chairs, one country, two systems. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so from then, uh, this one table and two chairs became um, a broader signifier of relationships, so it has been used uh, um, for many projects by Zuni. Uh, involving practitioners of many different types of um, uh, theatre from many different parts of the world. And so basically, uh, the traditional arts, or indigenous, I prefer as the term, of, of Asia, uh, so mostly no theatre from Japan, Kun Tu from China, and also there were practitioners from Indonesia, India, Thailand, um, participating in the festival in Nanjing. Uh, they were... Um, mm, I don't know exactly how they were matched, but basically you often had a, um, you, ha you usually had two performers, because mm. the, the, the format is one table, two chairs, two performers, 20 minutes. Right, okay. Yeah. Very prescriptive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not, uh, yeah, that, that's interesting, because yeah, it is prescriptive in a way, but at the same time it leaves you a lot of freedom, so it's been, it's been very interesting to watch how people interacted with the format and what kind of meanings mm. they invested uh, the, uh, the f this format with um, depending on where they came from uh, culturally politically also you know gender relationships class mm. relationship age relationship you, you you can do a lot like they do in fact in the traditional um, theater you know in in Beijing opera or Kunchu, for example one table and two chairs can signify um, a tribunal it can signify uh, the court of the emperor, mm. or it can signify, I think, if when they step on it, uh, it can mean you know a height or mm. a position of height. Anyway, so so basically, it's not that the the, the interaction is unstructured; it's it's quite structured, and that allows the comparison that I that be, you know, and also uh, another principle I think is this idea of deconstructing the the. Tra the, the traditional forms yeah. through modern methods mm -hmm. of directing and also by letting traditional and modern performers interact with each other. Mm. And what kind of statement do you think it's making about the sort of political situation in Asia? Is it almost, is it reflective of improving relations or do you think it's almost saying this is what we should be moving towards is this greater collaboration? Mm -hmm. Well, I think <clears throat> there's an artistic aspect to it which is related to this um, fact that couldn't you know and all, some of those other arts are, are considered now intangible cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. So this is felt by the practitioners as um, both, um, you know, um, source of pride 
and also I think a source of funding in, in terms of uh, <laughs> in terms of Kunshu, definitely China has uh, given it much more um, prominence in terms of cultural diplomacy after 2001. Anyway, so it's a form of, of pride, a source of pride on the one hand, but also um, a source of responsibility and anxiety, because on the you know you are a living national treasure, how they, they call them in Japan. Right. So as a living national treasure, what do you do? Are you do you belong to the museum, or are you um, responsible for mm -hmm. continuing the form in a way that can engage new performers, new practitioners, new audiences? So it's quite tricky, and that's why also the idea of the, calling the festival Toki, not only because of this uh, Sino-Japanese, uh, of its importance in Sino-Japanese diplomatic relations, but also because the Toki bird is, is caged, right? Right. So in a way, as a traditional performer, you belong to this cage, mm -hmm. where it puts you there as a treasure, but then what do you do from there? You know, you're a bit mm, constricted. So the idea of, of this project, Artistically, I think, is to try and find a way of developing these forms while at the same time respecting them. Although there's been discussions, you know, some critics say that this, this uh, Toki experiment was um, mm, kind of mm, violating <laughs> tradition, uh, yeah. where making it more, you know, banal. And, um, and, and politically, of course, I think it's an example of how you can produce, you know, a micro-political act of reconciliation through the arts, you know, and also the, an idea, the, you know, um, as I said, you know, arts, theatre, dance have, are often used for cultural diplomacy but, um, by governments. But in this case, you know, the political and governmental in, in, in intervention is minimal, if not zero. So, so it in, in might achieve something more genuine on a, on a human level, perhaps. And this is a sort of annual, is it continuing now that it's an annual project, or has it...? Um, from 2012 to 16, uh, it's been done every year, and I was there in 2015, I think, yes. Then I think, um, I'm not sure, I think because uh, the Japan side of the funding probably was, you know, has lim had a limited right. duration. Then it changed and Zuni started uh, something called Creative Playground, whereby young practitioners were taken to Nanjing on a study tour and also other practitioners of both modern, contemporary and traditional art went to Hong Kong to train the practitioners. Um, I don't think the Japanese presence was so conspicuous there. Mm. Um, but then it's interestingly, one of the participants from Singapore, um, a young, younger than Sato and Jung, um, director, he uh, participated um, in Nanjing and then he took the format to Singapore. Right, okay, so it's spreading <laughs> further away. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's this sort of distinctly Asian, you know, it's from, it's built on that cultural heritage. Um, and I think the way we've described it, almost described, sort of seems that before that, there was a different way of looking at theatre in Asia, and almost more of a Western-centric approach from where we'd be looking. So do you think that this has kind of changed the, the dynamics of theatre between Asia and the West, or do you think it's always had its own thing, but it's the way that we're looking at it has maybe evolved? Well, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know how much of an impact this particular project has had on the, on the practice in general, although, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to write about it is it was to try and, and show that there are different ways of of practicing, mm -hmm. let's say, um, tradition, and also perhaps different methods by which you can approach mm -hmm. the study of not only Asian theatres but also in the cultural theatre or comparative drama or theatre. So the idea, uh, and that's behind, uh, you know, this is why I apply this theory of Asia as method, which is obviously not my theory, but it's mm -hmm. uh, it started in the 1960 uh, Japanese scholar and sinologist actually, um, Takeuchi Yoshimi, uh, gave a speech called Asia as Method, in which he uh, proposed basically to try and look at Japan's modernization trajectory comparatively within Asia, so he also mentioned China, India, 
so very a very pioneering approach for, mm. for that time when Japan was mostly looking westward, you know, to America rather than Asia. Mm. And uh, and then uh, more recently, uh, this um, Taiwanese scholar Chen Quanxing wrote a book, I think in 2000, and was published. He wrote a series of articles in Chinese and then he published a book with Duke, I think. Um, I can't remember the date anyway. It's called Asia's Method Towards the Imperialization. And, uh, and, and this book uh, inspired me to, to try and think of how that theory, which he does not apply to the arts specifically in his book, um, uh, how could that work perhaps to, to look at the arts and particularly uh, at the theatre. Um, because um, I often find when I, when I read you know, theory of intercultural uh, theatre, also for example, if you look at comparative literature, world literature, uh, the benchmark, you know, it's always a Euro-American, mm. Caucasian, Anglophone, whereas everything else, Asia, Africa, um, tends to be marginalized or, or tokenized. Mm. Um, so, so in this case, the idea is to shift the focus of the inquiry towards Asia, which doesn't mean to, you know, to move from one, one some sort of hegemonic perspective to another hegemonic perspective but just to try and bring attention to practices that might, or, or areas that might have been overlooked um, and um, yeah so kind of decentering the, mm. the discourse basically and do you think there's a link to be made there between what's happening there and then what's happening more broadly in SOAS with the um, decolonizing the curriculum mm -hmm. uh, discussion that's been going on um, so for example you know making reading lists much less Europe, uh, American and British writer centric mm. and making those <coughs> much more open uh, well there are definitely echoes although my research not only the article you've read but I've written um, a book which I <coughs> finished recently on this subject so there are echoes between the two although they are not um, directly related on you know, the colonizing mm -hmm. source and, and my, my research, but definitely um, there are echoes and it's important, you know, both for research and, and teaching, you know, to include and to produce some sort of cultural shift where you include more and more non-West um, in the curriculum, uh, including, you know, teaching students to look at things from the perspective of the regions that we study mm. and in the language I would like to say of, of the regions mm. that we study because I think you know knowing the language of the, of the region that you that you are looking at is quite important yeah. uh, <laughs> to you know to if you want to understand anything about that region the culture and the language are quite some sort of the starting point so I also think that decolonization in fact if you work at the intersection at the crossroads between a region and a discipline is is again almost natural. It's a starting yeah. point because, for example, when we go to conferences, uh, it's interesting, particularly if you work in theatre. I find because when we go to area studies conferences, the theatre there's very very few of us there. Mm -hmm. But then when you go to theatre studies conferences, or performance studies conferences, the Asian um, stuff again, uh, the Asian content tends to be a bit sidelined. So. It, it's difficult to, to strike a balance and that's what I think is important to, to do. And do you think that the theatre still has that prominent role for questioning things that are happening or making those sort of reflections of society? Because I guess now I don't know how many young people are going to the theatre and I don't know if, and if they are, maybe it's like musicals and things mm. and I'm not sure if it's, is it becoming a little bit obsolete in terms of a reference point well the theater you know has also evolved you know we're so engaged with popular culture social media now you have online theater online mm. theater festivals a theater even including traditional theaters of asia you know like uh, last year there was a program here in london about now and neuroscience they've involved robotics uh, mm. AV, okay. um, ar <laughs> vr you name it and also it was interesting when i was in nanjing um, uh, the Tokyo festival to look at how audiences engaged uh, with uh, traditional forms. You know, you had, let's say, the fans, you know, the traditional fans, normally some kind of middle-aged, uh, mostly women, I, I think, who attended the performances, but then you also had quite young people. 
And it's interesting because they were constantly filming or uh, taking photographs of the performances and then immediately Instagramming mm. them, we, we chatting them, you know, we chat is the Chinese uh, most popular um, social media in China. So I think, you know, th there are still audiences that um, engage, uh, although the engagement both on the side of the practitioners and on the reception side has al also, you know, um, shifted. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I don't think you know, mm. <laughs> we can talk about obsolescence. Yeah. yeah, and if anything, it's nice to think about that becoming a more diverse audience and making it more accessible if it is online to probably more people than would have gone yeah. sort of physically yeah. to the theatre. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, thank you so much for talking to me today about um, your, your research and what you've been up to. It's been really interesting to hear. Um, and thanks for joining us for the SARS podcast. If you would like to hear more, you can uh, head over to the SARS blog or visit our website.